Hey, it's Brett, and this is Brett and Some Books. We're continuing The First Casualty by Philip Knightley. Um, this is Chapter 8, entitled The Real Scoop, 1935 to 1936. You know, when I first started in journalism, I used to think that foreign correspondents spoke every language under the sun and spent their lives studying international conditions. Brother, look at us. On Monday afternoon, I was in East Sheen breaking the news to a widow of her husband's death leap with a champion girl cyclist. Next day, the chief has me in and says, Corker, you're off to Ishmelia. Out of town job, I asked. East Africa, he said, and just like that, pack your traps. What's the story, I asked. Well, he said, a lot of black people are having a war. I don't see anything in it myself, but the other agencies are sending featuremen, so we've got to do something. Corker of Universal News in Scoop by Evelyn Wow. The secret, the secret treaties of the First World War had promised Italy economic control of Abyssinia. The treaty friendship between the two countries, signed in 1928, was seen by the Italians as a charter for economic and cultural domination of Abyssinia. The Abyssinians saw it as simply another uh, stage in their game of nations, their exploitation of the rivalries of European powers, and they observed neither the text nor the spirit of the treaty. Italy was confident that since other powers in the League of Nations had themselves used force to impose their rule in Africa, they would understand it necess its necessity in Abyssinia. Abyssinia, in turn, believed that since she was a member of the League of Nations, by which her territory was guaranteed absolutely and explicitly, her fellow members would, would quickly bring Italy to heel. So both sides confidently prepared for war. In Britain, the United States, and most of Europe, public sympathy was firmly with Abyssinia. Mussolini was regarded as a bombastic braggart trying to prove his country's newfound virility. Hail Selassie, the emperor of Abyssinia, the Lion of Judah, as a quiet, modest, and romantic primitive. Troops and war materials were being shipped from daily from Italy to Africa with the maximum ostentation. The Abyssinians moved barefoot through the mountains, armed only with sword and dagger. Although the outcome of such an encounter should have been obvious from the start, the pro-Abyssinian sentiments of the public blinded it to the obvious probability that the Italians would win. The Abyssinians would conduct a brilliant guerrilla campaign, trapping the advancing Italians in lion pits and, if given guns, would, according to a widely held view in the United States, be able to fire them with both hands and with feet. Baby, you are doing quite... As tension increased and the world's major newspapers selected their correspondence for the war that now seemed inevitable, it became apparent that the ignorance about Abyssinia and its people extended to the press. There is little known in the UK about this dispute, wrote the foreign editor of the Times, and even we must admit our deficiency in this area. Evelyn Wall, who covered the war for the Daily Mail, put it better. Few editors could find Abyssinia on the map or had the faintest conception of its character. Those who had read Nesbitt believed that it lay below sea level in stupefying heat, a waterless plain of rock and salt, below sparsely inhabited by naked homicidal lunatics. Those who glanced through sparsely inhabited uh, budge picture and America. African Thibet, a land where inviolable palaces jutted onto glaciers, the editor of one great English paper believed, 
that the inhabitants spoke classical Greek. The Daily Express chose its own war correspondent, O.D. Gallagher, mostly because he was from South Africa, and while with no real experience in journalism, much less in reporting wars, I didn't know the first thing about being a war correspondent, got the job with the Daily Mail after being turned down by the Daily Express because he had actually spent a few weeks in the Abyssinian capital, Addis Ababa, some years earlier. Correspondents with the Italian army wore heavy woolen belly bands on the advice of the army medical chief as a means of preventing cholera, while silk pajamas worn under the clothing were said to prevent typhus. None of this saved Wilfred Barber of the Chicago Tribune, who died in Addis Ababa of fever. Other correspondents, determined to be prepared for anything, went with rifles, telescopes, gas masks, pack saddles, and tents. Gallagher brought a mule train. Lawrence Stallings of Fox Movie Tone took a large red Indian by a motorcycle and sidecar. No one knew what to expect. Ernest Hemingway warned the American correspondents before they left that if they were wounded, the vultures would first peck out their eyes and then tear out their livers. But nothing that the correspondents imagined about covering the war in Abyssinia could match the heinous reality. When Scoop, Evelyn Wells' irreverent novel, Fleet Street, and the hectic pursuit of hot news in Ishmaelia, as it was called, by the newly appointed war correspondent William Boot, was published in 1938. It was hailed as a brilliant parody of his experiences in Abyssinia. What only the war correspondents present at the time knew, uh, present at the time, knew that Scoop was actually a piece of straight reportage, thinly disguised as a novel to protect the offer, author from libel actions. The correspondents began arriving in Addis Ababa in May 1935. By the time the war broke out in October, there were 120 of them. The British correspondents included George Steer, a young South African from a well-known newspaper-owning family in eastern London, covering for the Times and for the New York Times, Sir Percival Phillips, covering for the Daily Telegraph, O.D. Gallagher, another South African, aged only 22, covering for the Daily Express, and Evelyn Waugh for the Mail, for the Daily Mail. The Americans included H.R. Knickerbocker of the Hearst chain, Carl von Weigand, another Hearst man of Universal Services, Jim Mills of Associated Press, the ill-fated Wilfred Barber of the Chicago Tribune, and Ladislas Farago with the photographer Alfred Eisenstadt, Havas, the French agency, TASS, the Russian, Reuters, and the United Press were there also. It was a distinguished international collection of correspondents, and the Abyssinians were completely unprepared to receive them. Addis Ababa was a little more than a ramshackle town, a shabby, dirty, dusty place with lepers and eunuchs and slaves. It had a palace with two rows of lions in the drive, one hotel, one railway station, a post office, two cinemas, a radio transmitting station, a few plaster-covered Indian shops, and a collection of mud, wattle, and corrugated iron huts. To get there, the correspondents took a ship to Djibouti and French Somaliland, and then a train with wooden coaches and slatted windows to keep out the terrible heat. They stayed at the Hotel Imperial, which looked as if it had been transported hole from the gold rush in the Yukon, and which had about 30 rooms, so that at the peak of the war, there were three or four correspondents to a room. The Abyssinian Foreign Office had established a correspondence room 
uh, press section and accreditation involved getting the newspaper to guarantee a sum of money for its correspondent's repatriation should he for any reason be required to leave the country by reason of a misdemeanor. A war correspondent is only as good as his lines of communication with his newspaper and the first thing the newly arrived correspondents did was to see how they would be able to file the exciting stories they planned to write. How, in the words of the Daily Express, they would lay the truth about fighting on the Rita's breakfast tables. It did not take them long to find out that the filing facilities were not only primitive, but laughable as well. To begin with, the cable rate was three-fourths of a gold carat per word at that time, uh, about half a crown of the British currency, and one of the largest rates. This led to correspondents inventing the most uh, complicated cablees in a desperate attempt to cram as much as possible into a message. For instance, slongs for so long as, or for as long as, as uh, since the cable clerk typing away at his Morse key did not understand half the languages which he was so laboriously transmitting the correspondent's message, uh, the cablees further served to bewilder him. Cables arrived in London and New York so garbled as to be nearly unintelligible. The Times at first put this down to the influence of the American correspondents. The telegraphic influence of American type tyros assembled in Addis has been amazing, complained the Times foreign news editor Ralph Deacon. Even with the desire to condense news into the interests of economy, it should be quite easy to frame messages so that they mean something on this end. Gallagher has said that when the correspondents received clippings of their stories, as decoded by puzzled sub-editors at home, they not only were amazed at what had emerged, but also were often unable to understand what the stories had been about. Before censorship was officially imposed, a story went around among the correspondents that the garbling of their cables was deliberate and intended instead of censorship because it was cheaper and less likely to cause protests. Incoming communications were, if anything, worse the system of delivery was completely haphazard. A cable clerk waited until he had enough cables to justify engaging a delivery boy, and then the boy set off with anything to up to 50 cables and headed for the Hotel Imperial. Since he could not read, his delivery technique was to hand all the cables to the front, uh, to the first European he met at the hotel and ask him to pass them on. This enabled just about every correspondent in the hotel to read, at one time or another, his rival's messages and led to some heavy practical jokes. To review the tedium, or to relieve the tedium, Gallagher concocted a cable purporting to be for George Steer of the Times, and at the next opportunity he inserted it into the messenger's bundle. It read, Steer Times Addis... Ababa, we nation proud of your work, stop carrying on and name your king and country, Aster, proprietor of the times. Naturally, word of the cable reached the palace, where it was accepted as being true, and Steer was able to write the times. The emperor has given to me the longest interview on record, 80 minutes, and also broke a precedent to invite me to interview him, instead of waiting for a request from the times. He has given me free run of his ministries and seems to be highly satisfied with the attitude of your great paper. Gallagher says he thought seriously of sending himself a similar fake cable. Unfortunately, the patronage of even the emperor himself was of no help in getting any real news. As Gallagher noted, a reporter who cannot speak the language of the country he is working in can never get at the facts because he is completely at the mercy of either his interpreter or the official handouts. Not one correspondent in Addis spoke Amrick, except for Lithuanian, 
who was a general assistant to Jim Mills of Associated Press. The rest of us had to rely on what our Abyssinian interpreters told us in their poor English and official handouts. Otherwise, the interpreters slash assistants slash personal spies, as they were variously called, were cashing in on their ability to speak English and on the strength of their salesmanship. Was secretly employed an Abyssinian called Wazir Ali Bey until, so he said, he found out that Ali Bey was secretly employed by nearly every other correspondent in the capital. It was no use for a correspondent to decide to dispense with an assistant and set out to find news for himself. For one thing, there was the language problem, and still more important, the emperor refused to allow the correspondents to leave Addis Ababa, claiming that, probably with reason, since his tribesmen could not distinguish between an Italian or any other European, he could not be responsible for their safety. He also no doubt suspected that some of the correspondents might well be spies. The remarkable Harun al-Rashid, a German, who said he fought with the Turks in 1914-1918, had taken a Muslim name and who now claimed to be representing the Stuttgart Zeitung must have appeared very suspicious indeed. Harun al Rashid, who had shaved his head, had an attractive blonde wife, a manservant called Fritz, and a fine German built car, a custom built car. He and his entourage disappeared into the last stages of the war and afterward the Abyssinians claimed that he was really a Wehrmacht colonel, his wife a coding clerk, and Fritz a German ra Navy radio operator. This claim was never proved, but the Germans definitely had observers with the Italian troops, sometimes under the cover of being war correspondents, so it seems quite likely that there were German observers at Addis Ababa also. All these strictures being confined to Addis, being forced to rely on paid informers, and having no regular sources of information except official handouts, dictated the coverage of the war from the Abyssinian side and enabled the Abyssinians to present the world situation as they wanted it to be seen, themselves a gallant little nation with an army equipped mainly with spears and antique weapons and relying on justice from the world powers to prevent it having to go to war. If, however, war were forced upon it, all its tribes, loyal to the last emperor, Hal Selassie, would rise as one and, conducting a brilliant guerrilla campaign, would drive the invading Italians from Abyssinia, inflicting them on a defeat comparable to that of Adawa in 1896. Unfortunately, this picture bore little relation to the facts and was largely responsible for the misplaced optimism about Abyssinia's chances that persisted right to the end. It also resulted in a rash of invented reports, the product of frustration, and the arrival of one correspondent who was determined not to allow the Abyssinians' restrictions to prevent him from getting exclusive and newsworthy stories. The correspondent was the veteran Sir Percival Phillips of the Daily Telegraph. Sir Percival, knighted for his services to his country, if not to journalism in the First World War, took all the problems of the situation in his stride. He and Jim Mills, an old-style Associated Press correspondent, known to his colleagues in Addis as the Silver Fox because of his silver hair and professional cunning, scooped everyone with the Rickett oil concession story. Hail Selassie, in a desperate attempt to forestall Mussolini's invasion, signed over to Francis W. Rickett, a British entrepreneur representing American oil interests, exclusive concessions to a large part of Abyssinia. Phillips and Mills had followed Rickett throughout his stay in Addis Ababa, and they broke the story on August 30, 1935. 
Phillips could probably have rested his reputation on this one scoop, but he went on to further seek glory. What happened is best described by the series of cables O.D. Gallagher received from his newspaper, the Daily Express, soon after per Sir Percival arrived. Phillips and telegraphs as Abyssinian spearsmen massing on Tiger Front stop what follow-up XU. The second read, Danakil tribesmen mutilated Italian scouting party according Phillips and telegraph stop await action report XU. The third, Phillips describes Hale Selassie Square as Piccadilly Circus of Addis stop this great stuff stop let's have your comparisons Hale Selassie's capital with London. The fourth shows the Express's concern at being regularly scooped by the Daily Telegraph. Beg you to emulate Phillips. Stop your lack of your lack cables. Most disconnecting. Stop not only your job, but mine at stake, says Christensen, because I sent you Abyssinia, Sutton, the foreign editor. Gallagher remembers his reaction to the series of cables. I went straight out to check the Spearsman's story. No one seemed to know anything about it except per Sir Percival. Again, no one had heard of the mutilation of the Italian scouting party. The comparison of the squalid Halley Selassie Square to Piccadilly Circus was ridiculous and not worth rebutting. I had been brought up on colonial standards of reporting, where we had to be much more accurate because, in a small town, People knew what we were writing about. The store of wild romancing I was now witnessing actually shocked me, but in my youthful enthusiasm to save the foreign editor's job, I was not going to let Phillips get away with it, especially when I found that some of his best passages had been paraphrased from an old book called In the Country of the Blue Nile by Colonel C. F. Ray. So, with help from Noel Monks, an Australian colleague, I wrote a piece about, based on Colonel Ray's travels, updating and using it in the terms and situations of the Abyssinian War, and sent it off. The Express liked it, so pleased with my story and this new style of journalism. I did some descriptive stuff about the country, the tribes and their customs, but the wildlife that the Italians would encounter when they advanced into Abyssinia. I got congratulations on each day for a week. And then the final came in Saturday. It said, Philip's brilliant in telegraph, but you excel him. Stop, keep it up. Gallagher and Monks were astounded. Well, we know, Monks said. It's entertainment they won't. But there was a limit to the material Phillips or Gallagher could get from Colonel Ray's book, and the situation changed dramatically when, after months of preparation, the Italians attacked on October 2, 1935. The correspondents who had decided against general advice to cover the war from the Italian side did so at first not fare better than their colleagues in Addis Ababa, the Ministry of Press and Propaganda in Rome appeared unable to make up its mind whether the correspondence uh, would be allowed to accompany the Italian army. Actually, the ministry, which had some knowledge of how to influence the press and win support, wanted war correspondence, but not the army. The army would have preferred to confine its press to the series of communiques it issued through the ministry. These listed the progress of Italian troops, engagements, and the numbers of dead, wounded, and sick. As far as they went, they appear to have been reasonably accurate, but only the correspondents on the spot who were in the position to know what the communiques omitted. The first of these uh, was the United Press correspondent, Webb Miller, who had not wanted the job. I was disgusted by the hypocrisy, two-faced maneuvering and double-dealing of the British, French, and Italian statesmen, and by the prospect 
of watching the aggression of a nation with the defenseless people, I told myself that my duty as an objective reporter compelled me to stifle my personal opinions and sat in the grandstand watching and describing the parade not to join the procession carrying the banner and I knew that a writer who detested war made the best correspondent because the scenes impinged more vividly upon his senses. So Miller chose the Italian side. And like at least one other correspondent, Herbert Matthews of the New York Times came to understand and even sympathize with the Italian attitude to the war. Miller spent a month in Rome waiting for accreditation and suffering from the same procrastination that had made many other correspondents give up and go home. But Miller was not only a famous correspondent, he was also persistent. By badgering the ministry, he was finally accredited and issued press card number one. He left immediately by ship from Naples, sailed to Alexandria, then went on a British plane to Khartoum, then by an Italian plane to Asmara, the capital of Italian Eritrea, where the northern Italian army was massed for the invasion of Abyssinia. At the press headquarters, formerly the local fascist club, he found Floyd Gibbons, another American veteran of 17 of, to 18, who, with a special dispensation from Mussolini, had managed to beat Miller to Asmara by a day. These two men were the only war correspondents to witness the start of the war. There was not even an Italian correspondent present, and Miller rated his six-word message sent on October 2nd, 1935. Italians commence invasion, Ethiopia, 5 a.m., as the greatest newspaper scoop since the First World War. Other correspondents, including the military, military commentator General J.F.C. Fowler, now came pouring in from all over the world. There were British, American, French, Italian, Spanish, Austrian, Hungarian, German, Polish, Japanese, and even Latvian newsmen. The press office was overwhelmed. It began a system of news releases fed only for the waste paper basket. When the correspondents themselves set out, found news, and returned to Asmara to transmit it, they first had to submit their stories to censors, who tended to remove everything worth reading. As Matthews remembers it, the stupid censorship, uh, bad living conditions, the altitude, the crazy climate, the strain on heart, lungs, and nerves, all combined to create a colony of half-mad correspondents rushing frantically about in a state of chronic hysteria. The Italian commanding general, Emilio de Bono, did not, approve, did not improve manners by asking the correspondents, to pre-luncheon cocktail party in the officers club and then saying to them of course I don't like newspaper men or the press but I suppose we'll have to get along with each other the results of the Italian official attitude were far-reaching the clamp down on news from the Italian army coincided with the flush of invented stories from Addis Ababa since an invented story, unhampered by facts, makes more exciting reading than a heavily censored account of a minor engagement, newspapers plumbed the stories from Addis Ababa, and this created a false impression of what was happening in Abyssinia. Towns formerly held by the Italians were captured. Havas, a French news agency, was particularly guilty in this respect. Casualty figures were grossly exaggerated. At Adoa, in October, Abyssinian reports claimed that 700 Italian had been killed. The actual figure was six. Matthews said he had tried to tell the New York Times that lurid accounts from Addis Ababa should be treated with the utmost caution, but no one in New York appeared to pay any attention to this warning. What Matthews was up against 
was, of course, that of the truth, that the Abyssinians stood no chance against the Italians' mechanized army, was unpalatable. Sympathy suspended the reader's critical judgment, and he preferred optimistic but fake reports from Abyssinia to more factual reports from correspondence. And uh, with the Italian army, editors were not slow to sense this. The commands of Fleet Street became more Jesus, you are a fat, fat baby. The commands of Fleet Street became more and more fantastically inappropriate to the situation, Evelyn Wall wrote, and as Wazir Ali Bey, the most active of the interpreter, uh, assistants in Addis Ababa, retailed reports of more and more clashes in which the Italians suffered he heavy casualties. Wazir al Bey's news service formed an ever-increasing part of the reading uh, morning of the French, English, and American newspaper publics. While the correspondents with the Italians were fighting with the censors and among themselves and going steadily downhill from combined effects of fleas, flies, malaria, dysentery, and the attitude what had the outbreak of war brought for their colleagues in Addis Ababa. Early in the crisis, the correspondence with the Abyssinians had taken two steps to protect their interests. Both proved to be their undoing. The first was to form themselves into an association in the mistaken belief that this would improve their bargaining power with the Abyssinian authorities. The association had an important sounding name, Association de la Presse Interrige, and was dominated by the British and French, both because they had been the main movers of the idea, and because correspondents of other nationalities were impressed by their enthusiasm. The other move was to suggest the Abyssinian Press Bureau that it imposed some sort of military censorship. It is difficult to imagine why any war correspondent would actively seek to have his copy censored, and the reason advanced for this instance goes a long way toward explaining what was wrong with the coverage from Addis Ababa. We were set seeing all dispatches the chances of Abyssinia should it come to a shooting war, wrote the Australian Noel Monks. All Italian intelligence officers had to do was read their newspapers. The very hopelessness of Abyssinia's plight, one of one's natural sympathy, and because most of us had just that sympathy, it was we who suggested that some sort of military censorship be imposed in our dispatches. Once the Abyssinians realized that they could censor the news, it was but a short step to trying to manipulate it. Joseph Israels II, an American who had for a brief period uh, acted as correspondent in Addis Ababa for the Times and the New York Times, while Steer was trying to find out what was happening outside the capital, went off to New York to become Hale Selassie's public relations council, dispensing slanted news for the Abyssinian side. In Addis Ababa, the emperor's American advisor, Everett A. Colson, sorted out the most sympathetic correspondence, showing particular attention to Steer of the Times and would regularly reveal to them the government communiques the day before they were officially issued. Months being without information had dulled the correspondent's ability to assess the significance of what they now received, and those honored by being leaked official information
raced each other to the cable office to lodge their messages under the mistaken impression that what they were sending was news. In London and New York, the foreign editors despaired. The service from Addis Ababa was costing a fortune, and it was producing little or nothing which worth printing. Deacon, the foreign uh, news editor of the Times, complained that only a small fraction of the messages reaching London from the many correspondents in Abyssinia are, are what is wanted. The flood of trivialities that have been put on to the wire are no substitutes. Steer, whose main source of information was Colonel Kornovalov, a white Russian who was, Hale Selassie's in ser who was in Hale Selassie's service, wrote that the press bureau had become an instrument of internal propaganda and asked to be allowed to change to the Italian side. Deacon refused. Steer's dispatches and those of the other correspondents who were sending information leaked to them by the Abyssinians did have one value. They revealed that what the Abyssinians thought was happening, thought because it was rapidly became clear once the war was started that the authorities in Addis Ababa had no idea what was happening at the front and had no intention of letting anyone, especially war correspondents, find out. By mid-October, Censorship had so stifled reports on the progress of the war that the Newspaper Proprietors Association in London decided on a collective protest. It cabled the association uh, de la presse estranger and asked them to convey the proprietors' disquiet to the emperor. The Abyssinian authorities had never paid any attention to the Foreign Press Association, and now they took not the slightest notice of, more, of the more august body of newspaper proprietors. In fact, censorship grew worse because of a bombing incident involving the emperor. From the outbreak of the war, one story that had kept every correspondent from despair during the frustrating weeks of waiting was the Emperor's projected departure for the front to take personal command of his troops. Now correspondents were notified that the censors would pass no copy dealing with the Emperor's departure. The route he would travel, Italians, uh, or his subsequent whereabouts, although the Abyssinians reason that the Italians might try to bomb the Emperor were understandable it was galling for the correspondents to see the, cor the emperor and his party leave Addis Ababa in mid-November and not be able to report it. The Associated Press, however, managed to do so. Using a code disguised in inter-office messages, the AP's Albelson cabled to New York that the emperor had left for the front, traveling overland via Desi, the message had two direct results. The Associated Press was denied further cable facilities. The ban result, the ban was lifted after a week, probably because AP's tolls often amounted to a thousand dollars a day. And as the Abyssinians had feared, on December 6th, the Italians bombed the Emperor's headquarters. There were two reported versions of the bombing. The Abyssinian version was that 53 people were killed and 200 injured, that the American hospital had been hit, although clearly marked with a red cross, and that the emperor and several correspondents accompanying him had narrow escapes. The Italian version was that the bombing had been confined to the military encampment and the emperor's fortified enclosure. The hospital and the correspondents could have been in danger only if they had been located in the military camp. The significance of the attack was that the emperor ordered all the correspondents back to Addis Ababa, and there they were confined, those who chose to remain, until the end of the war. Few were prepared to endure this prospect, and the exodus that had started in November became a stampede. 
by January of 1920, of, of the 120 who had been in Addis Ababa at the start of the war, only 12 were left. Some went quickly. Wa was sacked, complaining to the end that his instruction to send national, uh, sensational but exclusive accounts was a paradox. He was a failure as a war correspondent and had sent little since he arrived, except a long cable predicting that the Italian invasion was imminent. To keep the story from his colleagues' prying eyes, Wall had sent it to Latin, sent it in Latin, and a puzzled sub-editor on the Daily Mail was still trying to work out what Wall was writing about when the war started and the scoop was lost. Others went in a rage when Stallings, uh, the Fox movie stone man with the red Indian motorcycle, the correspondent movie tone, had pr promoted by distributing posters reading, Okay, boys, you can start the war now. Stallings is here. Went out roaring. I've spent $100,000 U.S. and I haven't got one shot of the war. Stallings and other correspondents who left voiced their complaints to Time magazine. Time had been openly pro-Mussolini in its sentiments, and so the, fat, the magazine was delighted to express the fury of the correspondents who had tried to cover the Abyssinian side. Now, Time said that the Abyssinians had cheated the pants off the correspondents, it quoted Stallings as saying that the first round, that the first sound of an Italian plane, Abyssinian officers dived for the nearest Red Cross shelter, and that Hale Selassie's younger son had a palace that flew the Red Cross flag, although it was not being used for any Red Cross purpose. The statement should be weighed against Time's anti Abyssinian attitude and Stallings' frustration from his time in Addis Ababa. But there is no doubting the truth of the Times' conclusion. It remains impossible to obtain for love or money anything remotely approaching an accurate day-by-day -day account of the war on Ethiopia's fronts. Correspondents and cameramen at Addis knew less about the fighting they are supposed to be covering than the newspaper reader in New York. The reason American, the American news reader was better informed was that in November the Italians had finally let their war correspondents loose, and two of the better one, Herbert Matthews of the New York Times, and Luigi Barzini Jr., son of Luigi Barzini, of Corriere della Sera, had been sending excellent eyewitness reports. Easily the best of these was the first... Uh, main action of the war, fought by the Italian fighting column under General Oreste Mariatti. After that, it had been ambushed in End Gorge by the Abyssinians under Casa Sabat. The Italians had expected Casa Sabat to defend his mountain stronghold of Asby from an almost impregnable position overlooking the only means of access a mule track. Instead, the Abyssinians ambushed the Italian troops further down the valley. The Italian advance guard consisted mainly of Masauan tribesmen recruited along the coast, and then came the Italian officers, then Matthews and Barzini on mules, and then the camels, carrying artillery and provisions, flanked by another native battalion. When the Abyssinians sprang their ambush, the two correspondents dropped into a natural trench beside the track. The main firing came from the left flank, but other Abyssinians were harassing the column from the right and directly behind uh, and in front. Matthews and Barzini could not see properly, so they climbed back onto the mule track and crouched with some officers behind a tree. There they came under fire. Yeah, Nadia wants to be part of it too. <laughs> 
All right. Bullets, as Barzini wrote in Correa del Sella, dug into the earth with a puff of dust and into the trees with a small crash. While they were in the shelter of the tree, the first wounded soldier arrived. He was Masawan, barely 18 years old. Machine gun bullets had riddled the calves of his legs, but he appeared indifferent to the pain he must have been suffering. The blood which caked his trousers could have been easily mud, Barzini wrote. He stood at attention and asked timidly for the doctor. As if afraid to disturb him, Matthews, with a correspondence instinct, had taken out his notebook and was jotting down times and ideas. But even his sang -froid gave away when, fourteen minutes after the ambush had started, the Italian artillery opened fire in its seventy millimeter guns. That'll put the fear of God into them, he shouted to Barzini and began to crawl higher up the slopes to get a better view of the action. It was a dangerous move. A lieutenant was hit in the face and a sergeant major in the head, and a bullet ripped through Barzini's putties. For a moment, it appeared as if the position were about to be overrun, and an Italian officer advised the two correspondents to take a couple of hand grenades each for the final clash. But the Italian troops uh, counterattacked, routed the snipers who had been shooting down the correspondents from the peak, and forced Abyssinians back into Asby. And the cold dawn 